Far from being the dusty homes to relics of another age, museums might just be urban saviors for our time. Gail Lord is co-editor and co-writer of Cities, Museums and Soft Power, and she joins us now on the city building potential of museums. Welcome. Thank you, Nan. I'm so pleased to have you here. I'm, I'm delighted <laughs> to be here. It's one of my favorite shows. I, as I said, I learned a lot from the book, Thank and you. we're going to talk about the book in a few seconds, but I wanted to get to know you a bit more. Um, first of all, what is Lord Cultural Resources? Okay, so this company was started by my husband, <clears throat> Barry Lord, and myself uh, in 1981. So this year we're celebrating our 35th anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, two kids with a crazy idea and a crazy <laughs> dream in 1981 uh, was to, uh, we, we believed that the world needed to be planning culture a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so we started the company and uh, we thought, uh, well, we wrote the first book, which was the Manual of Museum Planning. We thought everybody in the world knew how to plan museums except, except Canadians, mm -hmm. but we got orders for this book from all over the world, and so that was really the genesis of the company, which has, which has grown. And you mentioned culture. What is culture? Oh, wow. So culture is how human beings create meaning. We have a very broad definition of culture. It's everything. I mean, obviously, TV Ontario is part of the cultural world. What we're doing is creating meaning right now. And uh, for cultural planning, we do everything, museums, zoos, botanical gardens, um, but we also do city cultural plans. We just finished the city cultural plan for Chicago, which is a, a big city, although not as big as Toronto uh, anymore. So, And in 35 years, I mean, like mm. it's such an incredible milestone. Mm. What would you say has been the most defining moment for you in those 35 years? Oh, God. That's a really hard question to answer. I think that, um, mm, the most defining moment was walking into the Museums Association in London, uh, which is the oldest museums association in the world. And I think that Barry and I are both very uh, kind of uh, Anglo-centric in a way. We, uh, we grew up that way, our, our generation, you know, half the world was pink and, and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And seeing all our books there and being known there, we, I was astounded. That's incredible. I'm deeply moved. I read an article um, when you first started. You were living in a log cabin in Hamilton. Yeah. <laughs> what were those early oh, days God. like? <laughs> right. So it was a log cabin outside Hamilton. Outside right? Hamilton. Okay. My husband's from Hamilton, so we know it's an industrial city. Yeah. And he actually grew up there. So yeah, uh, those early days were, were kind of fun. Uh, Barry was the uh, curator of, of a pioneer village, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and and. So yes, we, we, we lived at a fairly nice house, but it was on the premises and we, we did have to dress up in, in those kinds of pioneer clothing and our kids did too. And, and, uh, and it was a great experience and, and we, did start the, we did start the business in, in, in our bedroom there, yes. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, so let's talk about the book. I wanted to talk about this. Soft power, what is soft power? Okay, so soft power defines itself as the opposite of, of hard power. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe easy to say hard power is used mainly by, by countries, but it can be used by corporations as well, as a way of influencing behavior through uh, weapons, mm -hmm. war, money. So embargoes are hard power, you know, so the US embargo of Cuba, for example, would be, which has just ended, fortunately, is an example of hard power. So soft power is a way of, of creating influence by persuasion, uh, agenda setting, and, and of course, culture. And who wields soft power? Well, all of us. I mean, actually, TV Ontario wields a lot of soft power. Mm -hmm. and, and but it's very interesting. The agenda mm -hmm. sets an agenda, wow. right? It's actually a perfect example of soft power. The agenda by this particular program, by sort of setting forth a, a, an agenda of ideas, mm -hmm. exercises a lot of influence. The, the, the point of a book, though, is, is that the main vehicle of soft power today actually is cities. And the reason why it's cities is because now, since 2008, more than half the world's people live in cities. And so, as you know, 50% of the world's people, you have to think about it, live in cities, but cities produce 80% of the world's GDP. So cities have tremendous influence, but they're not national governments. They don't wield power through war, they don't wield power through economic boycotts, they don't wield power in those ways, mm -hmm. they wield power through influence. And how can cities be agents of soft power? And how? Well, that's a great question, and, and, and one that really 
intrigued Nairi, my co-author and I, when we, when we started the book. Um, cities are getting together and exercising soft power by setting agendas. Uh, so, for example, there's the C40 group of cities, which is uh, 69 of the world's biggest cities, you know, huge cities that have set an agenda about, about climate change. And they have 8,000 steps that cities should take in order to stop the climate change that's going on that's, that's really endangering all of us and endangering the planet. Other city there, in the last March, mm -hmm. there was a meeting of, of cities in, in Toronto uh, called uh, Cities of Migration. And this is a, an organization of about 200 cities that promote urban growth through migration, which is obviously a hot topic for us in Canada right now and, and indeed all over the world. So cities are, uh, with the city of Toronto sets an agenda to um, end child poverty, for example, or to have a poverty reduction plan, it is exercising soft power. And can smaller cities do the same, like Hamilton or... Great point. Yes, yeah, small, smaller cities can and do. Mm -hmm. They do it by banding together. Um, they do it... Small cities are, are flexible, mm -hmm. and they can pass the same kinds of motions and, and activities that the big cities do. And uh, I wanted to shift uh, gears a little bit and talk about museums. Yeah. Uh, for clarification, when we talk about museums, we're talking more than just the ROM here, right? Yeah, well, museums are, in, encompass an enormous uh, range of, of, of places. Mm -hmm. So they can be, like, the ROM is considered a, a kind of universal museum. Mm -hmm. uh, the AGO is a museum. So art galleries are part of this world category called, called museums. Um, botanical gardens are museums, zoos are museums. Any institution that kind of collects zoos. stories, objects, yeah, yeah. animals, right. ideas, right. um, is a museum. Yeah. It's, a, it's a broad definition. And so people like museums, some people don't like museums, I guess that creates a conversation. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, well, we'll find out. Maybe your, your viewers will tell us. <laughs> well, a lot of people like museums. Yeah. So let's go back uh, in time a little bit and talk about Role, the roles museum played in, back in history. Originally, what purpose did they serve? Okay, that's a, that's a really interesting and, and debated topic. Mm -hmm. Museums have their origin in in the collections of, of powerful people, right? Uh, they were they start as as private places, places in the court, or uh, you can think of reliquaries in churches. They, they're kind of the origin of museums is, is is there, but the real origin of museums, when you take a look at those collections, is in hard power. Mm -hmm. They're trophies of war. Napoleon conquers the world, brings back the art, brings back the sculpture, brings back the relics of, and 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 that's the Louvre, mm -hmm. right? Not the origin of the Louvre, but that's certainly the majority of what's in the Louvre today. In Canada, uh, the biggest source of our collections, actually all across the country, is, is work that was um, plundered, taken, confiscated from Aboriginal people and Indigenous people. So museums have a, I won't say universally, but they have a, a very deep history in, um, in hard power. And how were they viewed by the public back then? Well, back then is, is kind of a relative term. I think that museums have been places of learning, places of study, places of research, and people with high levels of education have always, have always appreciated museums. I think that the issue is how should the vast majority of the population feel about museums? The vast majority of the population doesn't participate in museums as much as they could or they should. Now, back then includes when I was a child, by mm -hmm. the way, and when I was a child, uh, you could get into the ROM for free, and you could get into the Science Centre for free. So the cost of museums is having an enormous impact on how people feel about them. And is cost one of the ways that museums have evolved? Um, fortunately, uh, one of the ways that museums have evolved in lots of good mm -hmm. ways, right? Mm -hmm. So you have museums being created in cities like Bilbao, which are beautiful, fabulous buildings. Mm -hmm. um, the additions to the AGO and the additions to the ROM have made them much more attractive buildings. Museums have attracted private money so they can do more things, they can be more engaged with the public. Um, but at the same time, government funding has decreased, mm -hmm. and so the cost of going to a museum has become very, very high. How would you characterize the uh, museum experience today? That depends on where you are. Mm -hmm. I think that the museum experience for many people 
is exhilarating and wonderful. It's a social place. You go with your family, you go with your friends, you, you can talk, you can interact. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a forum for ideas. They have lectures, they have films, and that, that's terrific. But for many people, they're, they're pretty intimidating places. They're not too sure where the front door is. They're not too sure what to do when they go through the front door. Most people know from watching television what to do at a hockey game. I always give that as an example. I wouldn't have a clue what to do at a hockey game. Neither would I. Oh, OK, good. So we share <laughs> that. basketball. So, OK, yeah. fine. Well, all right. But still, I wouldn't actually be too sure what to do at a basketball <laughs> game. But you, there's enough ways of seeing on TV. Like, I think TV Ontario should do a lot more with museums that would make people feel comfortable going there. I think mm -hmm. that uh, for a lot of people, it's an expensive, alienating experience. It's somewhere they went with a school group. Maybe they had a good time. It depends on how you feel about school. Maybe they didn't. But I think that the data tells us that school visits don't necessarily convert to lifelong habits of going. And I'm interested, um, what do you think TVO should do with museums? Well, I was looking at your lineup for the spring and summer, <laughs> and I was thinking that all those topics, like seeds, mm -hmm. museums have lots of seed collections, like, you know, that there are, for almost every single one of your, of your shows, mm -hmm. there's a museum companion story. And that would help normalize the museum experience, yes. As I said to you before um, we started shooting the show, the first time I went to a museum, I was 25, and I was in a different country. I was in Spain. Um, to what extent are museums still seen as elitist institutions? Well, I think that the good news about your story mm -hmm. is, did you like that museum? I loved it. I loved it. So, so, that's, so then yeah. what happened? Did you come back here and think, I'll go, I'll I go did, to museum? I did, and I lived in London for five years, and I didn't realize how good I had it there, because I could go whenever I wanted, and I didn't have to pay. This is in London, England, in not England, London, yeah, Ontario. No, no, in London, in England. London, Ontario, you would have had to pay. Yeah. OK, so that's a great story. Mm -hmm. So museums are, before we, they, they are tourism attractions, mm -hmm. and people, when they travel, go to museums. And that's great. Uh, and you're a perfect example of what happens with lots and lots of people. They'll go when they're in another city and they want to learn what that city has to communicate. They want to learn about the meanings mm -hmm. going on in that city. And that's, you know, you can go to coffee shops, you can go to bars, and you can go to museums, right? So that's fantastic. Now, the question is then, you were lucky. You went to London, where there's some of the greatest museums in the world, mm -hmm. and they're all free. I was shocked when I came back and I went to the Rama and I was like, what now? <laughs> well, I'm afraid that's the tale. That's the ultimate tale of two cities. I mean, that's yeah. exactly, exactly the issue. Yeah. Uh, so then what happened to you? I mean, I think that you're a prototypical case, frankly. Oh, now I have, I, I, fortunately, I have a membership to the Rama, but I split it with uh, another family member because I have two children and I want to expose them to, you know, things in museums. I love the atmosphere. So that's what it, I decided that I would forego doing something else to get a membership to the Rama. So we have Spain mm -hmm. and England to thank for your devotion <laughs> to museums. And I think that maybe that's, that, that's a kind of a, a typical story. Um, uh, you went to compelling museums outside the country, and now you appreciate what we have here. Exactly. So that, that's great. I, the contention of the book, though, is that our museums and museums generally can be doing a lot more. Well, in one of the essays, you write about um, one of the points that you make is that museums are good for women. And I wanted to talk about that. How is that? Well, all right. I think that's a section on employment. Mm -hmm. And we make the point that museums today are, are part of civil society, which is to say they're neither big government nor they're big industry. They're, they're sort of quasi, in Canada's case, independent, independent organizations. Museums, um, like other civil society institutions, are really great places for women to work. And there are also places where women play leadership roles. And that's one of the ways that they're very good for women. Unfortunately, women are not yet directors in the world's major museums. They are mainly men. I'd say about 90% of the directors of, of the major museums in the world are, are men. So we've just made two appointments here in Toronto, and they, they were both men. Having said that, though, two of the most talented museum directors in Canada mm -hmm. The are last women. director of the ROM was a woman. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. And two of the most talented directors in Canada right now are women, and that's the Musée de Québec and the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. And they, they, they're really making a huge amount of change. So I think that, that women are find great places to work in museums, um, but they're not yet in all the leadership positions that they should be. And another project that you walk, worked on, you had a significant role in Winnipeg's Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Yeah. How did that project get started? OK, well, um, yeah. If you ask me the question, what is the proudest thing I've ever done? You asked me what was the most amazing moment. It actually is the 
Human Rights Museum in Why? Winnipeg. Um, it's Canada's first national museum mm -hmm. outside the national capital region, which is something I think is really important for a country as big as Canada. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as diverse as Canada. It's also the world's first national museum dedicated to human rights, which human rights, climate change, they're the two biggest subjects that concern the future of humanity. And um, I, it's a totally great museum. It's the most technologically advanced museum in Canada, one of the most technologically advanced museums in the world, and it's a deeply moving place. It doesn't collect artifacts, it collects human stories. And I think that that's one of the really big trends in museums today, is to see their collections aren't, uh, they aren't just about objects, although objects do tell stories, mm -hmm. they are places where people's stories are collected and validated. I love that. Um, there was some, however, there was some controversy over the establishment um, with some criticizing everything from the way certain genocides were portrayed to the ranking of human rights. Uh, right. Is controversy good for a museum? Controversy is great for museums, mm -hmm. and I think our museums should all have more controversy. You can't deal with a subject like human rights without having controversy. I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. the whole point. After all, what are human rights? It's something that's very culturally defined. There are some parts of the world that don't agree with other parts of the world. And this goes on, you see it in the papers every day. What is a human right, okay? And uh, we can see in the treatment of our indigenous people in Canada. Uh, and, and, and by the way, it's really interesting that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, of the 90 recommendations or action items that it's made, a whole bunch of them are about museums. So museums really are places of contested history. Uh, there are places that, that should be contested and debatable. Now, when you, do you really want me to go into the human oh, rights? Yes. Okay. okay, so the Human Rights Museum was a controversial idea. The question of genocide is, is at the very core of the museum. And uh, the staff is all new. Remember, when you start something new, you get new building, new idea, new institution, and new staff. And so it takes a while for that staff to familiarize themselves, and you imagine the founding staff of TV Ontario it would have been mm -hmm. complicated, although an educational television did exist before. Nobody ever did a National Human Rights Museum before. So, um, yeah, there were debates on which genocide should be in the museum. In the end, they, they said, you know, we're a national museum, and so we will feature those genocides that the Canadian government has formally recognized as genocides. And so then there is a debate of is what happened to our indigenous people genocide. And I think that they came down on the side of saying it's cultural genocide. So these are complex. And uh, I think it's all negotiation. And that's so, because I remember in the book you were talking about uh, placemaking, where yes. it's a place where people can have these conversations and exactly. debate. Exactly. You know, and also, I guess, part of soft power. Exactly. And how, how has the city of Winnipeg benefited from having the museum there? Okay, that's, that's, that, that's something I'm really proud of again. Um, I'm from Toronto, but my family way back is from Winnipeg, so, you know, it, it kind of never, ne never leaves you in a way. Uh, with Winnipeg, they made them, they proclaimed themselves the city of human rights education. They know that they have problems, many, many problems uh, in Winnipeg, especially with the Indigenous population, murdered and missing Indigenous women, and we read about that in the paper every day. Mm -hmm. And so that they know that the Human Rights Museum, this is the City Council, I'm coming right back to the city theme, has really made a commitment that Winnipeg will be a human rights education city. Um, it, going along with that is the fact that the uh, archive of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission will be housed at one of the universities in, in, in Winnipeg. And so this was kind of going to create a, uh, a, uh, a, a scholarly mass for study and research and, and action. In addition, it's a powerful uh, magnet for tourism. Uh, Winnipeg was named as one of the 16 cities that you by, by National Geographic magazine that you have to visit before you die. Wow. It was the only Canadian city to make that list. Way to and go, it was Winnipeg. all on the basis of this amazing human rights museum. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, last year, uh, Winnipeg was in the news for a different reason. Maclean's magazine labeled it Canada's most racist city, right. uh, an image its mayor is trying right. to take action yeah, on. Right. How might the museum play a role in undoing that reputation? Right. So I think it's 
a reputation is something based on usually, hopefully, reality. I mean, not hopefully reality, but not, not just words, but, but reality. By um, one thing that the museum has done, by the way, is it's made admission free to indigenous people. And that was super controversial, just by the way. Um, they're on uh, land, uh, treaty land, and they always acknowledge that. The uh, exhibitions on indigenous reality, murdered and missing women, are very, very powerful in that museum. And they work with indigenous communities all the time, all across Canada, not only in Winnipeg. So I think that they're engaged in a process, and, and time will tell how much they contribute to that process. But they are consciously working with Aboriginal people. Now, you know, uh, Toronto actually has the biggest numerical population of Aboriginal people in Canada not as a proportion of the population, mm -hmm. but it's strictly numeric. So we could very well ask our own museums what they are doing. And, and, and you know, the Maclean's magazine could, could probably write, uh, produce a, um, or any magazine, Walrus, whatever, uh, a, um, a cover saying uh, Toronto, uh, Canada's center of child poverty. It's a true fact. And so the question that we ask in the book is, well, what are our museums doing about that? After all, we have lots of children visiting them. What are they doing? It happens that the Ontario Science Centre has done uh, an, a good exhibition on that subject. But what are they doing with those communities? So I think that's, that, I, I think that that's not just a question for Winnipeg. It, it's a question for all our cities. Um, I wanted to wrap up our conversation by bringing it back to the book. Uh, in the book, you have 30 w 32 ways museums can activate Don't their soft power. Don't ask me to name them all. No, please. no, no, I won't. Uh, we won't go through all 32, but we're going to take up yeah, five. Right. Um, reflecting the city, if you could just make a brief comment on reflecting the city. Okay, so museum boards should reflect the demographics of the city. Museum staff should reflect the demographics of the city. The boards and the staff are doing well on the women question, as we talked about, but certainly not on the ethnicity and race issues. And uh, so that, that, that's something that is really should be a goal of museums to change. An another point you have, we've talked about this briefly, free admission. Free admission is crucial. Mm -hmm. um, the, state, the data from, the U, from, from England tells us that when you have free admission, you increase attendance by 30 to 50%. Wow. Um, three, inviting and the, more... And you're the living example. Yeah. <laughs> and the third one uh, I want to talk about is inviting more people in. Right. So if you're a bad museum, i.e. uninteresting, dull, old, um, it, it can be free. You can pay people and they're not going to come. So but I, I don't want viewers to, to, to misunderstand the point. Um, being a great, interesting, compelling place, people will want to come and they'll come more often They'll enter those doors if it's free. But people also need to be invited in because if they see that, oh, it's a building I walk past every day, there are stairs, there are closed doors, they need to be invited in by relevant programs. Museums need to do things that are meaningful for people. So the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, I just want to tell you what the, Natalie Bondil has done. They're opening a new pavilion and it's dedicated to um, mental health. So they've identified that museums can work with all kinds of mental health organizations and deliver very powerful services to the community. Now that's inviting people in. And the second last com uh, point is in the news getting more media exposure. Right, yeah. Well, controversy is one way. Mm -hmm. Another way is just simply being relevant. I, I haven't seen too many articles. There are thousands of articles about what we're doing as a country for refugees. Very few of them mm -hmm. involve museums. And I think that that's kind of shameful because the collections of museums can be interpreted by people from Syria, people from the Middle East, people from, and yet that obviously our museums don't, don't feel that they want to particularly embrace that. And another one you have is developer dollars, like taxing developers for building near museums. Ah, that's a big subject. Yeah. Across the street from the ROM, there's a building going up and there's a huge billboard that says, uh, People who buy here will have forever views. That's Toronto. because, yeah, that's right. Well, <laughs> sure, because nobody's going to put a 50 story museum, uh, uh, condo on top of the ROM. At least I don't think so. So the question is how can people, either owners or developers, help contribute financially? to the benefit that these beautiful, we call, we call museums sleeping giants, um, uh, play. After all, they, they are beautiful buildings. They are well cared for. They add so much to the street. They're lovely places. They, but the people who benefit Should, most don't contribute. 
Do you and think the city should be putting more money into the museums as well? I think cities can't afford to, but I think developers can afford to. And um, we need to look at some strategies whereby uh, developers and people who live in developments who benefit directly the value of their condo, the value of their apartment uh, goes up, can make that contribution. And finally, uh, what cities are ahead when it comes to, to their support for museums and what cities are behind? Okay. Well, um, Toronto is doing well on support for culture. You know, they, we had a culture plan and, and, we, and, and we, we give a, we, we, I think it's about $25 per head goes, it goes into culture generally. Mm -hmm. Not very much of that goes into museums. Um, I'd say that uh, it's not only about money, it's about working with museums. When we did this book, and I interviewed people in social service organizations, I was, who have working on environment, refugee issues, and housing, poverty, issues like that. I asked them, do you ever do anything with museums? They were stunned with the question never occur to them. So museums are kind of sleeping giants. I don't think it's about money. I think actually museums have a reasonable amount of money. Everybody in culture needs more money. The question is, how can museums and cities work more effectively together? And I'd say that New York would be a good example, Chicago would be a good example, and uh, London, mm -hmm. your city, would be a great example. And I think that uh, our Canadian cities could be doing a lot more. Carol, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. It's been great talking um, to you. I, I, next time you're in town, we need to go glass shopping. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> right. Thank you. I live here, so we'll go glass shopping we'll go tomorrow. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.